Peter, how are you? I'm doing great. How about yourself? I am doing fantastic. I'm super excited to talk to you. When I told people that you were coming on, I got inundated with questions uh, <laughs> and uh, and all kinds of things to talk about. So maybe first, let's just start with the Russia-Ukraine conflict, I think is kind of the, the event that everyone is focused on at the moment. Oh, there's a war I hadn't noticed. Yeah. <laughs> when, when, when you think about that, what is your analysis in terms of like, how do we get here? And is it specifically related to just the NATO kind of expansion and, and what's I think been talked about a lot in the mainstream media, or are there other elements that led to this event that maybe people aren't as aware of or paying attention to? Uh, this was always inevitable uh, in, in any world where the United States is no longer banning war and is no, no longer regulating commerce in the way that we did during the Cold War and the post-Cold War period. Uh, the Russians were always going to go out and try to resecure what they see as the gateway invasion access corridors, uh, places like the Polish Plain, the Bessarabian Gap, uh, the Baltic Sea. They were always going to try to do this. Uh, what has changed is that the Russians are literally dying out. And the post-Cold War generation that was born through the 1990s was so small that the Russians were losing the capacity to field a regular army. So if they didn't do it now, they would lose the possibility and they would be then unanchored in this kind of great open flat zone in your, the middle of Eurasia. And the next time there's a war, they couldn't stop it. So they're hoping to forward position what they've got left in these gaps. And Ukraine, unfortunately, is between them and two of the most important gaps. So it's not just that they're going for Ukraine, they're going for Moldova, they're going for parts of Romania and Poland and all of Estonia and Latvia and Lithuania. It's just a question of timing. Uh, but Ukraine is the flavor of the month. Uh, I kind of see this war as the last conflict of the Cold War, because as long as the Russians existed uh, and if their security was going to drive their decision making. So it's kind of like how the Civil War was the final war of the American Revolution. We're kind of at the end of this section of history now. When you think about what's happening uh, kind of on the ground, and of course, I, I always am careful to say, like, we don't really know what's happening. But we can just go off of the reports that we're getting. Uh, sure. It seems like uh, Russia may have thought that they would uh, be able to be successful in Ukraine much quicker than they have been. So I think they've been a little surprised by the resistance that they faced. And also it appears that uh, they may have thought that China or other countries were going to have much more support for them than it appears that they do. Is that a fair categorization in terms of uh, maybe uh, some assumptions that Russia had going into it and they've been surprised by the lack of success or support that they've received? Absolutely. Uh, one of the things we've seen in a lot of the authoritarian governments that are in existence right now, most notably Russia and China, is that their leadership is completely isolated themselves from the rest of the world. And so if you are not, if you are in Putin's inner circle, you don't dare give him bad news because he will kill you. So there were a lot of assumptions that were made in the Kremlin that just have tr turned out to not be true. Now, in all due defense to, to Putin and the Kremlin, everyone in the West was thinking the same way. We never thought that the Europeans would pull together in the way that they did. We'd never thought that we would get any sort of meaningful international sanctions that included countries like Japan and Korea. We thought that the Ukrainians would crumble. We thought that the war would be over in a month. You know, everyone has gotten it wrong. But from my point of view, the single biggest flaw is the complete collapse institu institutionally of the Russian military. They are making mistakes that were worse than what the Iraqis did in 1992 or what they themselves did during the Chechen wars. Just that the inability of them to launch any sort of meaningful multi-domain operation and what we thought of as the second most advanced military in the world is just blows your mind uh, and forces the Russians now to do siege mentality tactics where they just obliterate civilian infrastructure because now that's the only way they can win the war. When you start to think about um, the participation of NATO allies in this conflict, there still is no no fly zone. There still is uh, at least officially no troops on the ground from those NATO allies. Uh, but there seems to be quite a bit of flowing of both capital uh, and weaponry to Ukrainian forces. Uh, how is that helping? It, it, would they not be able to provide this resistance without that? Um, and, and I guess kind of how important is it that the European countries came together uh, along with the United States to provide the support to Ukraine? 
Well, I don't have a good answer for you for how the Europeans came together because no one even in Europe anticipated this level of support. And everyone is taking any weapon system that they can that doesn't require a static footprint, uh, like a, so no jets because that requires an airport uh, or an airfield. But anything that can be carried or moved by truck uh, that is not nailed down is being shipped in. And the reason originally was they wanted to give the Ukrainians a fighting chance. But I think it was the convoy that was north of Kiev, the 40 mile long one, that terrified Western leaders. Because we hear we had this 40 mile convoy with thousands of vehicles that stalled out in a day because of lack of fuel, just horrible logistics. And then two days later, they ran out of food. And so all the soldiers had to get out and walk back to Belarus, just leaving their vehicles behind. Well, you know, from a certain point of view, that's a yay, the Russians are incompetent. But until you realize that if there ever was a direct conflict between Western and especially American forces and Russian forces on the battlefield, the Russians would be obliterated. That's a bad thing because it means that if Russia pushes through and captures all of Ukraine and then moves to its next stages, which are those gaps in Romania and Poland, for example, there will be a direct flight fight and the Russians would be obliterated and they would then face a simple choice. Do we go into a humiliating strategic withdrawal from which this country will never recover, or do we up the ante to include nukes? And so once that decision, once that issue kind of sank in in the White House and DOD, now we are almost desperate to send any possible weapon systems that we can. So in April, this war is going to be incredibly bloody because when the war started, the Ukrainians only had a few hundred uh, Javelin anti-tank launchers, and they only had a few dozen Stinger anti-aircraft missiles. Well, that was before the Americans started supplying things in bulk. They're only now starting to arrive. So we're talking about the uh, the Russians suffering tank and air attrition at an order of magnitude higher than they are right now. And this has gone from an issue, well, we need to slow the Russians and extract a cost, but we know we can't win, to a, if we don't win, we are really risking a nuclear conflict. So we have to do everything we can short of regular direct intervention to crush the entire Russian system as quickly as possible. So Ukraine is now the field upon which this will all be determined. Hey you, did you like this video? Great, we make five of them a day and post them here on this channel. Make sure you subscribe, like the video, and see you next time.